Okay, everybody. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining in tonight. Uh, we should have a great prob uh, great program for you tonight. Uh, I'm Jerry Darkus. Uh, I'm executive director of the Trout Club, and uh, really appreciate everybody sitting in on uh, on tonight's program. Uh, the The Trout Club is actually an affiliate club of a natural history museum, uh, and we are active in uh, conservation activities and programs uh, with a focus really on the Northeast Ohio uh, area, uh, specifically, you know, the Lake Erie drainage net. We got a number of projects in the works that will uh, be coming out over the next month or two. Uh, one, one big announcement before we get started is that we do have the fly fishing film tour back at the museum. Uh, that will be on March 5th. Uh, the films are going to start at 7 p.m., but we'll have displays and other activities going on, uh, opening up, I think, around 6 o'clock. And uh, in order to get tickets this year, you can go directly to the uh, film tour website and, and purchase them. We will have some for sale at the door, possibly, uh, but uh, expecting that it will probably sell out prior to the event. So it's a flyfilmtour.com and there'll be a schedule with all the events. Uh, and our, our presenter tonight is Carl Wexelman uh, out of Erie, Pennsylvania. I've known Carl for a good number of years uh, and we bump into each other quite a bit on and off, uh, steelhead fishing around, you know, the rare streams in Ohio and Pennsylvania. Uh, Carl is a, a noted guide uh, and author. Uh, he has, I know you've done probably dozens of magazine articles, uh, and uh, you've got one book that you did by yourself, Great Lakes Steelhead and Salmon. Uh, and uh, I know you've co-authored another book, uh, Keystone Fly Fishing. I think you did the Northwest Pennsylvania part of it, and rumor has it you've got another article coming or another book coming out uh, sometime in the hopefully near future. So uh, without wasting a lot more time, uh, Carl, I'll turn it over to you. If uh, questions come up, uh, you can put them in the chat room. Uh, we'll we'll keep a monitor on that. Really, cool. you know, we will. Uh, you know, that's fine if you if you want to. Uh, ask the question, you know, directly at that point too. We just want to try and keep the, the program moving in that too. So anyhow, Carl, uh, let you get rolling, buddy. Okay. Thanks a lot and have fun. Bob, we all good to go? Yeah, we're good to go. Carl, I think you might still be on mute. How about that, boys? Can you hear me? All good. Oh, uh, look at that library George Klein has behind him. No wonder he's so darn smart, huh? Anyway, so I want to thank you guys and thank the Cleveland Museum of Natural History Trial Club for inviting me to do this uh, program tonight. Um, I've done this program uh, more than once uh, locally and over in Ohio. But uh, I know you guys got a lot of new members involved in the uh, Cleveland Museum of Natural History Trial Club. So mm -hmm. I hope they find a lot of the things I'm going to talk about tonight uh, very interesting. Um, I also want to thank Richard Bobby, who uh, did all the graphics and helped put this slide program together for me. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Jack Hanrahan uh, for doing all the photography on this uh, fly fishing, the surf zone uh, of Lake Erie. Uh, the one thing I wanna let people know is that these, uh, these strategies and, and these techniques and, and these fly patterns that we're gonna talk about today, um, it can be used throughout the entire Great Lakes region. Uh, it doesn't have to be um, just limited to the Pennsylvania shoreline, everything, uh, uh, we'll work on the uh, Ohio shoreline 
It'll work on the Michigan shoreline. It's going to work on the Lake Ontario shorelines too. So it's not just a specific area where, where, where you can have success catching steelhead off the beach. Um, I, th I think you can do it pretty much on, on any Great Lakes or near any tributary that has an actual steelhead run. Uh, next slide, please. So you can tell I was a lot younger there and I looked a lot better, but uh, we'll go to the next slide after that one too. Okay, here's what we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, Lake Erie South Shore. I used to call it an untapped fly fishing resource uh, because before you had people like me writing about this, uh, you were able to walk lots of beaches on your own and not run into anybody. Um, but uh, one of my more successful articles I ever wrote for Fly Fisherman Magazine uh, was about catching surf zone steelhead. Uh, certainly since then, I've seen a lot more people fly fishing the beaches. Uh, you, you go back maybe 20 years ago, and uh, a lot of these beaches that we fly fish here, here in Pennsylvania anyway, you'd run, in, you'd run into nobody fly fishing these beaches. So, I mean, it's, it's a good thing that other people want to do it. And if you haven't done it, I hope I'm going to get you into it tonight. So we're gonna talk about where and when to do it. We're gonna talk about gear and tackle, the things you need. Um, flies, big flashy streamers. Uh, since we first put this program together, I've actually kind of uh, toned that down a little bit. You don't always have to use big flashy streamers to catch steelhead off the beach. And then we'll talk about uh, presentation and uh, what works. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, let's move on to uh, number two. So here's a Lake Erie beach. To, to me, the environment of fishing these beaches, it, it reminds me of when I lived in New England. Uh, I lived in New England for 10 years uh, before I came back to Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, I came back about 20, 22, 23 years ago, I came back to Erie. But uh, before I came back to Erie, I used to fly fish the beaches of New England for striped bass. And so when I came here, I'm like, geez, I want to start doing this for steelhead. So I started using some of the tackle and, and some of the techniques that I used to use for striped bass off the New England coast. And I started using them off the Lake Erie beaches for steelhead. And uh, uh, once you catch a steelhead off the beach, in, in my opinion, you might not want to catch them in a, in a tributary anymore. Uh, they're not in a confined area. So you have this huge expanse of fresh water in front of you. And hopefully you'll learn how to catch steelhead off the beach uh, by using what we talk about in this program tonight. Uh, next slide, please. So you, you don't even always have to focus on steelhead off the beaches, uh, especially throughout the Great Lakes. Uh, there's a lot of other species about, that abound on the Lake Erie shorelines and all the Great Lakes shorelines. Uh, I have friends that have caught lake trout off the beaches around here. Uh, in the summertime, I will sometimes actually target sheephead off the beach, especially off of Prescott Peninsula. Um, we have carp that swim up and down these beaches. You have bass. You have largemouth, believe it, off these beaches and smallmouth. So you shouldn't just go fly fishing off the beach just for steelhead, although I think that's still the best fishing catch off the beach. But some of these techniques will work for other species as well. Next slide. So this picture is, is, is a photograph of, of me double hauling a fly line off the beach. And if you see what I have strapped around my waist is a homemade stripping basket. And uh, during this presentation, I'm actually going to show you how to make a homemade stripping basket. Why do you want to use a stripping basket off the beach? Well, number one, if you're laying all your fly line on the water, when the water, when the line shoots off the water, creates drag, you're not going to be able to cast far enough. Uh, number two, you can actually just plain cast the line a lot farther off the beach 
when you use a shriveling basket. I don't always do it, but I do it most of the time. Next slide. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the best steelhead that you can hope to catch. When you hook a steelhead off the beach, you're, you're, you're hooking into a different beast, I think. You're hooking into a different fish. Um, how many of you guys have been into your backing when you're fly fishing the tributaries? Raise your hands. Any hands raised? I can't see any everybody here. But uh, how many hands were raised there, Bob? Steve? Hi, Steve. So, okay, Steve has raised his hand. So I, I can count on maybe one hand how many times I've been into my backing on a tributary. Maybe two hands, maybe one and a half. Uh, most of those steelhead that I hooked that went into my backing uh, were up on, you know, big water rivers like Salmon River up in New York, uh, places of that nature. But the, uh, the neat thing about catching a steelhead off the beach is you're, you're, you're literally catching the freshest run steelhead because it hasn't even actually run a tributary yet. You're going to catch the chromiest steelhead that you'll ever catch. And if you've never seen your backing, you're probably going to see it on the first or second fish, first or second steelhead that you hook off a beach. The fish are just immaculate specimens of the species. Next slide. Oh, personal watercraft. Uh, here's another way you can fish off the beaches. What slide number is that? Number 10. Um, a lot of my weight uh, fishing off the beaches is, is waiting. You don't have to use a personal watercraft. Uh, when, I, when I talk about a personal watercraft, I'm talking about um, a lot of people are really into kayaks now. A lot of people, uh, I'm starting to see kayaks on Lake Erie now. Um, I've even gone off these beaches in Lake Erie on float tubes. Um, you got to be real careful putting a float tube in front of Trout Run in Pennsylvania now because the boats will come in between your float tube and the guys fishing from the beach. I had a boat come in between me one year and I looked down in the water and I got spoons flying right by my legs dangling in Lake Erie. So you got to be real careful about that. But uh, I've always really enjoyed fishing out of pontoon boats off these beaches. Uh, like I said, a lot of guys are, are doing this now uh, with kayaks. Um, but you don't have to have all that gear. You can certainly catch a lot of fish just by wading. And sometimes you do not want to wade. You do not want to step in the water. And we'll talk about that later. Next slide, please. So what you want to do if you're going to throw a personal watercraft or whether you're going to wade fish one of these beaches is you want to wait till you have optimal conditions. Uh, what are optimal conditions? Uh, we normally are looking for southwest winds, south winds, or southeast winds um, that aren't putting a, a big uh, wave crashing into the shore. But uh, conditions on Lake Erie, as anybody that's boated on Lake Erie or fished down in Lake Erie, uh, you know that uh, conditions can change uh, drastically within hours. Next slide. So even when you're using these personal watercraft off of these beaches, you want to kind of read the water the same way you would read it from if you're actually standing on the beach. Uh, you can see here Rob is casting into some darker, greener water, which is an indication of deeper water along these shorelines. Uh, this happens to be photographed in front of the mouth of Elk Creek. There's nobody on that shoreline. There's nobody on that shoreline. Um, I think if you went out there next October, you'd see a little, little bit more people on that shoreline. Uh, next slide, please. So even using these personal watercraft, where we also are utilizing double haul techniques, and I have a whole series of slides uh, where you can learn the double haul that Richard put together for me. 
And uh, we'll get into that later too. Next slide. Okay, personal watercraft. You can also use a kayak, a float tube, or a pontoon boat to get away from people on the beach. There's certain beaches um, that are, you know, actually started starting to get more, more pressure on them than, than they used to get 20 years ago. But you can hop in a float tube, get on the other side of that tributary mouth, and there's nobody there. Uh, one thing I want to talk about while I got this slide up is beach access, Lake Erie access. I'll tell you a quick little story. I was fishing uh, this one beach and uh, this guy comes down to the beach. He says, what are you doing here? He goes, you're trespassing. I go, what do you mean I'm trespassing? He goes, you're trespassing. I'm like, I'm standing in Lake Erie, my friend. I'm not trespassing. Lake Erie is a navigable waterway used for public commerce. The public has the right of way access along the Lake Erie shoreline to the high water mark. Now, where that high water mark is, there can be some arguments there. Um, we're waiting for uh, Don Benzikowski, a PAC grant, to come to one of our meetings where he's actually got a formula to where you can find the high water mark. And the high water mark isn't just necessarily where all these branches and trees are pushed up on the bank. The high water mark does change and it is kind of seasonal. But if your feet are wet, if you can drive your boat to where you're standing, you are not trespassing. So this guy calls the state cops down, state cops comes down. I'm guiding two guys off the beach, and it's an overcast blast of a day where we're hooking lots of fish. And these guys thought they were going to get arrested. So state cop comes down. He goes, this guy says you're trespassing. I say, no, I'm not trespassing. I'm standing in Lake Erie. Lake Erie is a navigable waterway used for public commerce. I have right away access to it. He goes, oh, okay. So then they call um, a waterways conservation officer. Waterways conservation officer comes down. He goes, Carl, how did you get here? He didn't. He didn't say, Carl, this guy says you're trespassing. He says, Carl, how did, I, how did you get here? I said, well, I walked down this one tributary to the Lake Erie shoreline. I made a right-hand turn when I got to the beach. I kept my feet wet. I walked all the way to this position. That's how I got to this position right here with my feet wet. He goes, oh, okay. The guy who was the property owner turned out to be a lawyer from Erie. And uh, now he lets me park a lot closer. I don't have to walk so darn far anymore. So as long as your feet are wet, you're not trespassing. Don't let anybody else tell you that you are. Next slide. So here you can see a progression of slides that, that we took on this particular day. And you can see that the surf conditions actually got rough. So it started off real nice and calm. Surf conditions get rough. People, a lot of, a lot of people think that you can't catch steelhead off these beaches uh, when the surf starts to get rough. Uh, that's totally false. Uh, you can catch a lot of fish off these beaches when the surf gets rough. Uh, you just got to be careful when these waves come into you that you don't get knocked over. Uh, it kind of helps if you turn your hips to, to the wave to, to kind of break it from going over your waders. But sometimes the fishing can actually get better when the water gets a, lot of, a, lot, a little bit dirty from the uh, action of the waves. Uh, and then the fish are not so spooky as they would be if the water was crystal clear. Now, I actually prefer the water to be crystal clear because I like to see them swimming down the lake coming towards me. That's just my personal preference, but even in rough water conditions, you can still catch steelhead off the beach. Next slide. So as you can see, you can see those three four foot breakers hitting the beach behind Rob right there. And uh, we took those pontoons back into the shoreline, did some blind casting and uh, hooked up on a couple of fish that morning before, uh, before it got too rough to fish. Uh, next slide. 
Mm. These are the conditions I like. I like nice, clear, calm conditions. I like that water crystal clear. That one of the reasons why I like it so much is because that's how I learned how to catch striped bass up in New England off these beaches. You can see them swimming through the first trough uh, off, off the beach, the first trough off the beach. You can see them coming down. Um, when, when you have these conditions, you can actually visually see pods and actually sometimes large, very large schools of fish coming down the beach. Uh, what they're doing is they're, they're searching for a tributary mouth. They're kind of sniffing around and they basically will come in, go out, come in and go out. Um, but I look for a, a south wind, which makes that beachfront calm. I want clear water. And to me, it's just a lot more fun when you can sight cast to schools of steelhead or pods of steelhead. It's a lot more fun to me than to actually uh, fish dirty water and not see them. I'm not saying that either or is the best way to do it. Um, I think uh, most people that cast the fly like to cast the fly to a sighted fish. And uh, that's what I like to do, too. But it's like cooking a, it's like cooking a bone fish in, in, in fresh water. Um, you got to lead the fish. You got to let that fly sink before you start to strip and uh, bonefish won't cartwheel six times going airborne in a row, like steelhead off of Lake Erie beach. will. next slide. Okay. You want to get happy guys. You want to get smiley face like that. Go to your nearest beach that has a tributary mouth near it start exploring it. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a harbor entrance. It doesn't matter whether there's some flow going out into the lake. Sooner or later, Steelhead will, will swim along lake these Lake Erie shorelines. Um, and uh, if you haven't targeted uh, Lake Erie Steelhead before, I certainly hope that uh, some of you would give it a try. Hi, Sue. Next slide, please. Okay, what are we talking about? We're talking about absolute, total, chrome bright fish, fellas. Next slide. Let's talk about where and when to fish for surf zone steelhead on Lake Erie beaches. Okay, like I said, you can do this on any Great Lake shoreline. So, Steelhead are spurred on by the need to spawn, right? They want to run up these creeks in which they're planted uh, in, in order to try to procreate, even though they don't have a whole lot of luck procreating on our shale bottom substrates. They give it a good shot. So they're searching for an acclimation point, let's say. Um, I mean, steelhead are certainly known to stray on Lake Erie. Um, I've read a lot of data on fall run steelhead up on the Cattaraugus Creek. Those are actually mostly Pennsylvania steelhead. So they stray all over the place, but they're searching um, for an acclimation point or, 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 or a stream mouth or a river mouth. Um, and they'll stage out in the lake before they actually get the right conditions uh, before making a run up that tributary. So Elk Creek, Kanye Creek, Arcola. There's hundreds of them. Um, I'm almost a firm believer that if you have a water pipe dumping in the Lake Erie, a steelhead's going to swim by and hold there at, at one point in time. There's a warm water discharge um, uh, coming out of um, uh, the old GE plant here in Erie to the uh, uh, west of Four Mile Creek. And it's just a little waterfall dumping in the Lake Erie. And we catch steelhead in front of that little waterfall dumping into Lake Erie. So you can find steelhead virtually anywhere, but they're going to mostly be around the tributary mouths. And the wind determines what side of that tributary mouth they're going to be. And I hope to talk about that later on during the program. Next, please. Okay, be aware, however, that surf zone fly fishing for steelhead is not limited to those major tributaries. I just discussed that. Uh, the surf zone areas around almost any mouth or any tributary that feeds in the Lake Erie can hold staging steelhead that are, are willing to take a fly. I mean, even some of these little tiny trickles going into Lake Erie. 
especially early in the season, if it's like a small stream. I'll give you an example of one that we have here in Erie, Pennsylvania. There's a very small stream called Godfrey Run. And that stream, you can jump across that stream very easily. And um, the stream is a, a small spring-fed stream. It's heavily canopy, meaning it's heavily covered with trees so that water stays cold. And any of these colder water uh, little tributaries dumping in the Lake Erie, sometimes those little streams are going to track the fish before the larger tributaries do. Uh, it's up to you to go kind of figure that kind of stuff out. Next. Okay, I, I normally start looking for steelhead when Lake Erie water temperatures drop to around 66 degrees. Um, I'd much prefer those temp water temperatures to, to be uh, less than that. Um, so what I start doing is I start looking around the shorelines near, near tributary mouths. I try to find areas that are void of other anglers. Um, during good conditions, like I talked about, those clear, calm uh, days when the water is nice and clear, you can actually watch schools of steelhead cruising up and down these lake shores. Uh, they still retain those very aggressive predatory instincts. Uh, they kind of meander near these tributary mouths in a circling manner, meaning that I've seen the same school come in, go out, come in, go out, come in, go out. Um, yeah, they want to run that tributary, but sometimes uh, that tributary doesn't have a lot of flow going out into the lake. So there's not enough flow for them to run up into that tributary. Sometimes like down at Walnut Creek access area, down in the channel, they swim up the channel, they swim out the channel, they swim up the channel. They're kind of trying to figure stuff out. So uh, all these fish that are living in Lake Erie, especially late in the fall, late in the fall, you have young of the year emerald shiners. And there's lots of these schools of young of the year emerald shiners off these beaches and near these harbor mouths and, and near these piers. And uh, they're putting on the feed bag before they run. So they're going to chase and attack virtually any bait fish pattern uh, that you get near them. It's kind of a match the hatch thing. Um, those young of the year emerald shiners are, 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 are rather small, but uh, we'll talk about fly patterns later on. Next slide. Okay, here's some typical staging and shore access. A, a lot of our beaches um, have lots of public access points. Uh, Pennsylvania's been pretty good at procuring public access around these tributary mouths. Um, Ohio has tons of public access near uh, tributary mouths, and these are a good place to start searching. Um, one thing I want to emphasize, though, is that you don't have to be standing at the tributary mouth to catch fish. If I go to it now, I'm not saying that that's not a good place to be because of course it is. But if I get to the beach a little bit later than other guys get, there's like two or three guys there already. Well, hey, you know, they beat me to, they, they beat me to the lake. Well, wind direction will determine really where you're gonna find those fish off that tributary mouth. Next one. So here's some more state parks in Ohio that are right on creek mouths. I think Geneva State Park has a couple little tributaries going through it that feed Lake Erie too. So beach access is pretty good. And like I said, if your feet are wet, you're not trespassing. So what happens with steelhead when they're swimming up and down these beaches and, and they're looking for their quote unquote acclimation point? Um, Let's say we have a, a wind coming from the west, which would be the left-hand side of the screen right here, right? Well, wind coming from the west is gonna blow the scent and any water from that tributary mouth to the east, to the right. If the wind is from the east, the wind is gonna push those steelhead to the west of that tributary mouth because the current is going to be, if there's current going out into the lake, 
it's going to be turning. The wind's going to blow it to the west. So that's where you're going to find uh, most of your fish. Um, I've been on Lake Erie beaches where the actual tributary mouth might be considered, the beach might be considered unfishable because you got three, four foot breakers coming into it. But I found coves on like northeast wind that are protected on a northeast wind that might be maybe a quarter mile or a half a mile away from a tributary mouth. And those steelhead will actually pot up and school up in these coves, either to the west or to the east of any of these tributary miles going into Lake Erie. Because basically most of our tributaries are flowing north into the lake, correct? So you really kind of adjust where you're gonna find fish off these beaches by which way the wind is blowing. Next one. Uh, here's another place in, in, in Erie, near the mouth of Elk Creek, Lake Erie Community Park. Lake Erie Community Park has a tiny little tributary going through it that dumps into Lake Erie, and you can catch steelhead there too. It's just to the uh, east of the mouth of Elk Creek. So if you go to like a popular beach fishing access point, there's usually other opportunities nearby. That, but you got to hunt them down. You got to put them to footwork. You got to go there and see if they're there. Uh, next slide, please. Next, what best way to see if they're there? Usually, if I go to a beach, you want to see fish jumping. You want to see fish rolling. You want to see fish porpoising. I look for those south winds that, that I've told you about. I like those clear, cool nights that, that will result in a calm shoreline and a colder water temperature, especially early in the morning, especially early, early, early in the season. Um, we talked about sight fishing to these cruising fish. Uh, south winds create that clear and calm condition. Uh, north to northwest winds will eventually create mud lines along the lake, depending upon how, um, you know, what that mile per hour, usually if the, if the wind's going over 10 to 12 miles an hour, uh, those waves coming in from the north, northwest or northeast will usually create a mud line along the beach. Um, I've been on some beaches where there's a terrible mud line on Lake Erie, but the flow from the creek going out to lake is actually crystal clear. Go figure, huh? Sometimes you just don't know until you go do it. And that particular day that that happened, there were steelhead cruising in and out of that dirty water into that clear water going out into Lake Erie. But uh, sometimes these, these mud lines really depends how long you have that turbulence occurring. Uh, sometimes they can clear within a 24 hour period on a south wind. Guys, there's no CFS gauge on Lake Erie to tell you whether the water is dropping or whether it's going up. Sometimes you just got to go look. And, and, and that is uh, very applicable on a Lake Erie beach too. Next one. Okay, best time early in the season, dark through first light. Why do I want to be there in the dark at first light? Well, early in the season, when that water temperature is, say, low 60s, mid 60s, um, those fish are going to be in early. You can actually catch fish in the dark. I got friends, a lot of friends here in Erie that use a lot of glow in the dark materials for tying their flies. And they have very good success uh, off those beaches, actually in the dark. Um, I got a buddy of mine, Bob, that keeps beating me to the mouth of 16 Mile Creek because he lives there. Uh, that's great because uh, he usually catches three or four of them. And he's done by the time uh, the sun's just starting to come up in the east. So dark through first light early in the season. I'm talking early in the season. I'm talking late September early October, uh, as a season, you know, those fish will come in for a while. Then you got the bright sun, then you got the water heating up and then boom, they're gone. So early in the season, dark through first light, I think is, is going to offer you, offer you the best shots. Uh, look for rolling fish, uh, look for porpoising fish. Uh, you'll hear them splashing in the dark if they're there. And like, like I said earlier, they're just kind of 
cruising around in a circle, sniffing around, looking for a place to run. Next slide. Okay, first slide is usually the best time early in the season. Uh, as the season progresses, water temperatures will drop. Uh, you can catch them throughout the entire day off of the beach. Sometimes I'll go hit the beaches in the evening because everybody's gone. I can finally get a nice spot to myself. Um, I've had surprising success during the midday uh, in short sleep weather, believe it or not. Um, but that's normally where there's a cold water tributary dumping into the lake. Like I talked to you about earlier, those smaller cold water tributaries usually attract fish pretty quick. And if you got that cold water going into the lake, there's no use for the fish to swim back out in the warmer water. Um, this was a couple of years ago, and I actually have been catching them on much smaller fly patterns than I used to uh, uh, fish. I used to think I, I had to have a big flashy fly out there, you know, those steelhead are cruising. They're circling around. They need something to, you know, to get them, get them going, uh, to trigger that predatory in instinct. A lot of the local boys around here, what are they doing? They're catching a lot of fish, right? What are they doing? They're throwing spoons out in the Lake Erie and cranking them in. Well, that's a pretty big profile, a lot of flash involved in that. And uh, the guys, uh, hardware guys throwing spoons off the beach, catch a lot of fish. And so sometimes you want to emulate that. But uh, I really kind of downsize my flies I, I use off the beach. I, I downsize them when that water is crystal clear and when the sun's on the water and that water's real, real calm. Certainly downsizing will help you catch a lot more fish under those certain conditions. Obviously, if you're fishing a dirty water beach, you want something big and bright that they, they can see or something big and black. I've had good success in, in dirty water with a big black uh, Woolly buggers. Next page. Okay, there's lots of structures off these beaches too, right? I think one of those first slides that we put up, um, it showed me standing on a concrete block on Lake Erie. So we have rocks, we have other kinds of structures such as break walls. Break walls are normally found near, near uh, um, channels leading uh, in the harbor areas near tributary mouths. Uh, they provide elevated platforms for you. Uh, that gives you a better idea when you're up in the air, it gives you a better idea what's going on along the beach. And that helps you, when you can get high up in the air, it helps you read the water so much better than when you're like wading out. So if you get a little high, you can read the water a lot better. I'm gonna be talking about that. So if you can utilize anything to help you get above, the water a little bit, use it, uh, maybe, excuse me, maybe stand higher up on that uh, sandbar on, on the beach or that gravel bar on the beach. If you get up a little higher, I, I, I can even remember of, of uh, reading articles about people that fish these lakes out west for a, um, a specific type of cutthroat, a Lohontan cutthroat. I'm not, not too sure what they were called. But there's some lake out there called Pyramid Lake, I think it was called, where the fly fishermen that fish those beaches out on these lakes, they actually carry a step ladder to the beach and they get up on that step ladder and start casting from it. That's a pretty goddamn good idea to util utilize on Lake Erie, but I have yet to see a person and I have yet to take a step ladder onto a beach. But if you can get a little elevation, it's going to help you with the casting. Lots of piers. There's lots of you know rocks and old break walls jutting out in the lake area. If you can get a little, if you can get a little elevated, I, I think it makes the fishing a little bit easier for you. Next one. Okay, read the beach as you would a stream. We already talked about the fish will already uh, show themselves by jumping or breaching. Um, one thing I, I do look for is I look for bait fish scattering. Just like salt water. I mean, you're you're fishing an inland ocean, just like that excellent book that Jerry Darkus wrote. You're fishing an inland ocean right here. So you have the same type of fish behavior. You have predatory fish chasing bait fish near shore. You can see bait fish scattering. Sometimes I'll see seagulls dive bombing bait. 
Well, if you see seagulls dive bombing bait on Lake Erie, there's probably some steelhead underneath them pushing them to the surface, right? And that doesn't have to be by the actual tributary mouth. Like I was saying, the wind blows the fish up or down these beaches. You got to figure out where they're going to be on that particular day that you're going to fish. Uh, next one. So best time to familiarize yourself with the beach is on a sunny, clear, calm day. Uh, that allows you to read the water. It allows you to see color uh, changes in the water. Color changes in the water are an indication of depth and shallowness. Light colored water, sandy colored water, pebbly colored water is shallow water. Dark green water is going to be deeper water. So a lot of times I'll walk these beaches away from these tributary miles and I'm looking for drop-offs or I'm looking for those dark green troughs that actually it provides basically a road. It's like a cruising corridor for steelhead swimming up and down these beaches. Now, the other thing you need to understand is these steelhead that are swimming up and down these beaches will stage. They're not going to be constantly moving up and down. Sometimes you can find a trough uh, either down uh, to the east or to the west of a, a tributary mouth where the steelhead are laying in there like tarpon laid up down in the Florida Keys. You might not see them, but I catch a bunch of fish by fishing these darker colored troughs somewhere in the vicinity of, of, of a tributary mouth. And I'm catching a lot more fish out of these troughs. One, two, three, four, five. I'm throwing the fly into the same area and I'm getting bit. That tells me these fish are holding in these areas off the beach. They're not actually cruising at that point in time, but they use these troughs and these dark depressions as like roads to travel up and down the shoreline. And I already told you about bait fish and bird activity. Next. Okay, gear and tackle, what you're going to need, fellas. Um, layered outerwear to match the, the weather conditions. Uh, I like a, a, a baseball cap uh, so I can uh, see into the water, number one. Breathable waders. Uh, you got to have polarized glasses. You can't fish a beach without polarized glasses. Uh, that helps you determine what the water color is. Uh, it helps you determine whether that water is shallow, helps you determine whether it's deep. It helps you determine whether you can actually see that school coming down the beach, swimming towards you. So, yeah, you know, wear what you got. I don't think it's all that important, but uh, I, I, I do like a pair of five millimeter boot foot neoprenes in the wintertime. And I will tell you, I have actually caught fish off the beach in the winter. But that's another story for another time. Let's keep moving. Okay, the slow to medium action fly rods. A lot of guys use slow to medium action fly rods in the tributaries, uh, especially early in, in, early in the fall, because you're really dropping down on tippet size. So you need a rod that's going to uh, be a shock absorber. Um, I used to like fishing those Scott X2S fly rods. Um, I really think most people that are fishing off the beach, uh, the bottom line is if you want to cover water, you got to be able to bomb the line, right? Uh, so you're going to want a fast action fly rod for bombing the water. That's if you want to cover a lot of water moving up and down a tributary trying to locate where fish are. Uh, seven weight fly rods are good for most conditions on the beach. Uh, and eight weight might help uh, some casters uh, to punch the line into heavier or windy, windier conditions. Um, you don't have to have specialized tackle for fishing the beach. I think you can still catch a lot of fish by going down to the beach with your standard steelhead rod, nine to 10 foot six or a seven weight or an eight, whatever you got and a weight forward floating line. Uh, if the fish are in close to shore, uh, that's what I'm gonna be using most of the time. 
if I'm searching for fish and I'm walking up and down the beach trying to find fish, I'm norm normally going to be throwing some type of shooting head fly line. Next one. So yeah, I've been using those real outbound clear tips. Um, the front portion of the line, it's approximately 30 feet, maybe 28, uh, sinks slowly. Uh, it's seamlessly integrated into the rear portion of the line. Um, the rear portion of the line is a is 60 feet of thin level floating running line. Uh, the running line is what allows for distance casting. Um, the head section is going to be a lot thicker. Thicker fly line um, creates drag along the guides, slapping against the rod blank. That creates drag. Uh, it doesn't shoot quite as well. But once you get that heavier 30-foot head, 25 to 30-foot head out beyond your rod tip, you can double haul that fly line and you can bomb it anywhere from 60 to 90 feet. Uh, normally, I'm going to use, if the water's clear, I'm going to use 12 to 14 foot of fluorocarbon leaders. I don't think you have to have fluorocarbon leaders. I think fluorocarbon's overrated. I've caught plenty of fish on, on nylon uh, tapered leaders, so to one or two X off the beach. Uh, I've had big steelhead hit a streamer so hard that they've broken three X on the hit. Um, you got to know that they're intent uh, on killing and eating your streamers. Uh, if you're using intermediate or, or sink tip clear lines or sink tip lines, I don't see a lot of use for, for sink tip lines. Um, if I think if I'm fishing like off a break wall, uh, that's where sink tip lines are going to be more applicable. But a lot of times, most of our Lake Erie beaches are pretty shallow. And uh, if you want to get that fly uh, down a little bit deeper, I just like a loop to loop tungsten leader. Uh, but that's not even uh, necessary all the time. Uh, you can catch a lot of fish off the beach with your standard steelhead fly fishing gear. Next one. Do it yourself stripping basket. Why go to Orvis and blow, what, what are they now? 80 bucks on a stripping basket? You can make your own stripping basket by going down to Walmart, buying one of those Sterilite containers that you see. So what you do is you buy one of these Sterilite containers, grab that drill, uh, start drilling your drain holes in there. So if water comes into your stripping basket, uh, it will drain out. It won't push your fly line out of that stripping basket. I use a bungee cord for wrapping that around my waist. I will usually position that stripping basket off of my left hip because I'm right-handed. Uh, the Sterilite containers that you buy, anywhere approximately from, from 8 to 12 inches, uh, you just want to make sure they're, they're deep enough, maybe a 10-inch 10, 10 depth on those. Drill quarter inch, so half inch drain holes. Um, and then I drill small uh, one eighth inch holes and I put zip ties up through the bottom of the stripping basket. What those zip ties do is when you're stripping the line back into your stripping basket, the zip ties keep that line coil, the line coils separated and displaced. Instead of coils being piled on top of each other, that will sometimes tangle. When you have those zip ties up through the bottom of the stripping basket, it separates those coils and spaces them apart so that when you get that shooting head out beyond that rod tip and you double haul that fly line, the shooting line will jump from that stripping basket much smoother than if you didn't have them in there. So use some zip ties up through there. You can make one of these for probably five bucks. Why spend 80 when you only have to spend five? But uh, that's just from living in Erie, PA. We're just blue collar boys at heart. Next slide. Big flashy streamers. Boy, I talked a lot about big flashy streamers. I'm watching those guys check, chucking spoons off the beach. Man, they're catching more fish than I am. I need to fish a big flashy streamer. Well, you don't always have to, but they sure as hell work a lot of times. So prior to running up the uh, tributary to spawn, uh, the steelhead feed heavily on bait fish. 
and they do feed very heavily on those young of the year emerald shiners, which are best imitated, in, in, in my opinion, by a little fly, little streamer fly, real simple, real easy to tie. It's called a little precious. And I believe Jerry Dark, Darkest was nice enough to include that little precious uh, streamer fly in uh, one of his articles in Fly Tire Magazine. So thanks for that, Jerry. You can look that up. It's real simple. It's real quick eat, quick to tie. It's the ultimate guide fly. I can crank them out quick. And they catch tons of fish, even in the tributary itself. So these spinning rod guys, they, they're, they're throwing long casts. They're fishing the spoons. They're fishing the spinners. They're covering a lot of water to attract uh, a cruising fish. They catch a lot of fish. So I started fishing when I first started doing this. I love stripping in those big flashy streamers. I love watching those steelhead chase it right into the beach, right, up, right off my rod tip. And then one day they wouldn't hit that fly. I'm fishing that big flashy streamer. They kept following it in right in front of me and they turn away, they wouldn't eat it. They turn away, they wouldn't eat it. Well, it just wouldn't trigger them. It wouldn't trigger them because I think I needed to really match the hatch of what they were feeding on on Lake Erie. And I actually wrote about this in one of Matt Sapinski's um, uh, journals that he's uh, uh, he's got a new online magazine. I've done a little bit of writing for Matt. And I talked about matching the hatch of these Young of the Year Emerald Shiners. Uh, so that little precious is a great imitation of those Young of the Year Emerald Shiners. I'm not saying that those big flashy streamers don't catch fish. If they're turning away for your, from your fly and you're not getting them to eat it, go a little, it's like tributary fishing. Go smaller, go sparser, go a little bit more natural. Next, next slide, please. Uh, bait fish imitations, emerald shiners, preferred food source of Lake Erie steelhead, olive and white clouds or minnows, olive, or, olive buggers will catch a lot of fish, bunny strip streamers um, that you incorporate some flash materials in. Uh, I got a buddy of mine, uh, uh, Lord rest his soul, Mark Wyman, who, who said the only fly you need to catch a Lake Erie steelhead is a white woolly bugger off the beach or in the tributaries. And you know what? He could be right. Next one, please. Okay, weighted marabou streamers are really, really easy to tie. You got one, two, three, four, five steps to tie them. Little marabou on the belly, little marabou on the wing, uh, some dumbbell eyes, throw a little flash off that tail. Boom, it's done. It's going to catch fish. Next fly. Oh, I like giving, I like using the barbell eyes, those dumbbell eyes. Uh, one of the reasons why I like using those a lot is because it gives the fly a, an up and down jigging action off the beach, whether you're stripping it or whether you're fishing it under an indicator. And are you going to ask me if I fish flies under an indicator off of Lake Erie Beach? you darn right I do. And we're going to talk about that next, I think. Uh, here's another fly that imitates the Lake Erie Emerald Shiner, uh, Emerald Candy Flies. It's I started tying these that has to do with some of my saltwater background uh, before I came back to Erie. Um, these are tied with mylar tubing. We used to tie flies up there called sand eels that imitate a bait fish up there. And this is kind of how we tied sandal fly patterns up there. Mylar tubing over the hook, uh, over uh, other materials that you can use, using mostly synthetics on the ones that are pictured here. And then I'd epoxy over that mylar tubing. But you know what? Those things take a lot of time to tie. Um, I've uh, really switched over to using almost entirely that little precious streamer fly. But if you want to uh, tie those, you can tie these two. It's a great pattern. It's translucent. It's got that, I mean, it looks exactly like an emerald shiner. Um, they're very effective. I, I actually like fishing those when I'm fishing uh, uh, a tandem, a tandem rig. I'll use two emerald candies, but the fly is about three and a quarter inches long. 
And these are tying instructions in case anybody wants to learn how to tie these. Uh, next one. Uh, I'll leave this up for a minute or two. This is a list of materials if you want to tie that emerald candy. Uh, the tail is synthetic fish hair or similar material. And everything is tied in at the head of the fly before you put the mylar tubing over it. And then you cover it with clear five, uh, five minute epoxy. And then I use a little nail for hand painting um, the eyes in the front of it. Let's go ahead and go through these, please. So you want to weight the hook. I always use 0.30 fly, uh, a fly wire. Uh, if you want to weight the hook before tying in your other uh, materials. I like weighting these emerald candy flies because the epoxy tends to keep the fly higher up in the water column. So I like to weight them before I tie in the materials. Uh, next slide. So you're going to tie a little white material in um, for the belly. Uh, all the materials are tied in at the head of the hook, as you can see. Next. A um, little olive material over that. And you don't have to use fish hair. These are just some of the materials I've used in the past. Feel free to substitute uh, anything you got laying around. I don't think the fish are all that picky as to exactly what material that you're using. Um, as long as it imitates an emerald shiner, uh, you're on your way to success. Let's keep going. Uh, add a little silver, blue, pearl, purple crystal flash in there. Uh, lately, I've been using uh, a lot of uh, a lot of flashaboo. Doesn't have to be crystal flash. You can use flashaboo. You can use different colors to create different looks in your fly patterns. Um, I don't get too carried away with having to have everything exactly the same. Um, but I, I've been mostly using flashaboo lately. Next. There's a little flashaboo. Throw a little bit more flashaboo on that. Little peacock curl on top because most, most bait fish have that kind of a little bit of a darker olive green back to them. Uh, half hitch the thread and then cut it off. And then you're going to cut a section of mylar tubing. You're going to slide it right over uh, the hook and cut it the length of the hook shank. Once you slide that over, you want to reattach the thread. Crank down on that mylar tubing so that it binds to, to, to the head of, head of the hook right there. Crank it down real hard, crank it down tight, and it's gonna form a beautiful translucent body that's the perfect imitation of an emerald shiner. So then I'll take a toothpick and I'll put uh, five minute epoxy over the tubing. Um, and then I rotate, I, I mostly rotate the fly by hand. Um, a friend of mine, uh, uh, was so nice. He made me a rotating fly wheel so I can put the epoxy on and the hooks are rotated so I get a nice smooth minnow shape as the epoxy cures. But you can certainly use your hand for doing it. Hold it up, hold it up, hold it up, hold it up. Use your toothpick to smooth it out. Um, so the epoxy application, what it does, it, it allows a whole spectrum of colors to emanate through the body of the fly, just like the real thing. If you've ever held a fish or, or even an emerald shiner uh, in your hand to the sun and you turn it around inside and down, you'll notice that there's all kinds of silver might be prevalent. Um, but if you really look close, there's all kinds of colors that emanate from virtually every fish species that you can hold in your hand. So that epoxy finish makes it look like a very translucent emerald shiner, which is what they are. Next one. So then I just use a nail head, a little dab of white paint, a little dab of black paint. If you want to protect the paint on the eyes, um, put a little dab of epoxy over that too. 
Uh, you can also use a permanent marker to darken the back or create gills on the body of the fly. So there's lots of things you can do with these emerald candy flies. Um, it's an extremely effective pattern, don't get me wrong. I don't fish them as much as I used to because there's so many processes that I have to go through in order to create the perfect emerald candy that uh, normally I just now fish that little precious fly. Real quick, real easy, Jerry will tell you how to make them. Next slide, please. Okay, there's some more flashy streamers you can fish. Beadhead marabou flies work fantastic off the beach. Uh, another, another thing that spin fishermen uh, fish off the beach, what are they doing? What are they doing? They're throwing out a bobber with the jig underneath the bobber, and they're twitching that right in, aren't they? They catch a lot of fish. I've learned a lot from watching spinning anglers catch fish off the beach and incorporating that in my fly fishing techniques. So a nice beadhead marabou streamer, what is it? It's a beadhead marabou jig. Twitching that underneath the bobber off the, off the beaches works for spin fishing anglers just as well as it does for fly fishing anglers. Marabou wing clouser. I think we went over these real quick, real easy to tie. Don't have to get too fancy. Um, I don't think the, the, the fish are, are extremely, um, how would you, how would you uh, 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 name it? They're, they're not super, super finicky off the beach. Um, I think the times where, where you really have to pay attention to your fly size or fly pattern is really when that sun is up and that water is crystal clear. Just like in the tributary, go smaller and sparser. If that water's calm and crystal clear, uh, bigger and brighter. If there's some wave action and the water's a little, a little, little colored up. Next one. Here's another simple, easy fly. I'm a simple kind of guy. I mean, you know, I like uh, Leonard Skinner, simple man. So I like to try to tie simple flies. This is a lot quicker and easier to tie than emerald candy. And it's just basically material stacked on a hook. Um, a little white underneath for the belly. That's actual silver Christmas tinsel that you hang on your Christmas tree. And a little bit of uh, crystal flash on top of that. Next. Marabou tail clousers, they catch a lot of fish. I think by adding a, a marabou tail to it adds, adds a little bit more uh, action to that fly as you're stripping it in. And those dumbbell eyes or those barbell shaped eyes give that fly a jigging up and down motion as you're stripping it in. So it looks like a wounded bait fish. And bunny strip flies. Uh, these flies generally tend to work a lot better when the surf is a little bit dirty. You're, you're going to be putting out a, a much bigger profile that the fish can see a lot better. Uh, the surf's a little, little messed up. There's a little bit more movement in that kind of fly. Uh, much bigger profile. Um, I also like going big and black when that water's dirty. I don't, I'm not positive why black works so good in dirty water. I, I think the fish can just basically see it better. Um, so water dirty conditions go much bigger. Bunny strip flies seem to be uh, quite productive uh, uh, in those types of water conditions that you can encounter off the beach. Am I done yet? No, I'm not done yet. Fellas, come on now. Presentation of what works. Let's talk about how to catch them, huh? These are the key steps to the double haul. Let's see what we got. So what you want to do is you want to strip off about 70 feet of fly line, and you want to coil it into your stripping basket. You want to make sure that when you put your fly line into your stripping basket that you're putting it in the right way so that it don't all tangle when you make a cast. 
Sometimes you gotta learn the hard way. Next one. So arrange the coils so that the line shoots from the top of the coils and not from the bottom of the coils. Next one. Okay, here's, here's where you get into actually hauling the line. The, a haul of the fly line is basically a pull of the fly line. If you're right-handed, you're gonna be hauling the line with your left hand. If you're left-handed, you're gonna be hauling that line with your right hand. So you wanna start the back cast in the first haul uh, with the line by pulling away in the opposite direction of the rod hand. So I could kind of sit, go like this, vroom. That's the action, vroom. Pull it down. That's the haul, haul that line. I always tell people when, when I'm teaching them to, uh, to fly cast, to accelerate and stop, accelerate and stop, accelerate and stop. That's the first haul of the fly line. Next slide. Here is where everybody makes their mistake. They do not follow the line. With me, it would be my left hand. They do not follow the fly line back into the rod. So you just made a big haul of line, okay? Your, 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 your hauling hand will be down below you now, down by your waist area but you didn't follow it back. So once you perform that first haul, follow that fly line back with your non-rod hand. You have to do that. Otherwise, you cannot make that fly line fly out of the basket. If you don't follow it with your left hand, you will not be able to properly execute a double haul fly cast. So with the line hand, immediately follow through in sync with the back cast snap or the back cast haul. Next one. On the forward cast is when you initiate the second haul of the fly line. <clears throat> what this does is it increases line speed on the forward stroke of the cast and it loads your rod. Once you get your timing down, you will feel that rod bend. If we go back into one of those earlier slides, um, you will see that rod bent to the max. At the moment of the forward stroke or forward cast or forward snap, as Richard wanted to call it, In my left hand, because I'm right handed, go, you let it go. And those coils that are in your stripping basket are going to fly right out of there. Now, you don't have to have a shooting head line system to catch fish off the beach. Like I said earlier, you can get by with a standard weight forward floating line. Um, but even if you could double haul a standard weight for floating line, I think in some circumstances, it's going to help you catch more fish. Okay. Next slide, please. Keeping the line in sync with the forecast. Uh, that's pretty much uh, self-explanatory. Next slide, please. Okay, two good double hauls should put the forward section or the head section to go just one, two, out beyond your rod tips. Once you shoot your rod tip, that's when you can 
juke 70 to 90 feet of fly line with just two series of double hauls a lot well you're casting an awful fish is searching for fish you're casting you're casting your arm off when you're bombing it so if you have less work while you're casting you're going to have less fatigue uh, but more importantly i think that means it keeps the fly in the water a lot longer and that could very well be the more important thing on that next slide please okay techniques retrieving and stripping before starting to retrieve you want to use the countdown method to establish the most productive depth so one one thousand one 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 thousand two one one thousand three uh, a lot of times I will throw that fly in front of me to see how many how many seconds, let's say I'm wading waist deep, I'll throw that fly in front of me, count it down to see how many seconds it takes to hit the bottom. And I'll say, well, that's three and a half feet. It took me one 1,001, one 1,002, one 1,003 seconds for it to sink. Well, that water out in front of me, I think, is six to eight feet deep. So then you're going to want to go one one thousand one one all the way down to one one thousand eight or nine or whatever it may be. So you want to kind of use a countdown method to kind of figure out how fast is that flag going to drop through the water column before you start stripping it in. So here's one method that we used to use in salt water, and it, and, and I've hooked a lot of steelhead doing this, believe it or not. Uh, a lot of guys just want to strip that fly, strip that fly, strip that fly. But this is a saltwater technique that, that does work around here, and I don't see too many people doing it besides me. Uh, once you've made the cast, you actually cut, tuck that cork handle right up underneath your armpit, and you're using both hands to strip the fly line into your basket. Um, try as you might, I, I really don't think you can outstrip a steelhead that's bent on eating your fly. Um, you do want to, you know, vary your tree. You know, sometimes you can rip that fly and they're going to slam it. Sometimes you want to hop it, let it sink, hop it, let it sink, hop it, let it sink. Try different retrieves. It's just, just like any other fishing. Different retrieves will work at, in different water conditions. Uh, water is a little bit dirty maybe a much slower retrieve to give those fish time to find that fly in the water. So try different retrieves, but fast stripping is a general technique that, that works good. Another retrieve that works is to pull the fly. This is like a Bob Clouser retrieve. He uses one to three foot spurts, and then he gives it another twitch with the end of the line at the end of the strip. Uh, while keeping the line tucked under the rod handle. I always like keeping that rod tucked under, the fly line tucked under uh, the cork on the rod handle. So when a fish whacks it, I can tighten to it and, and get them hooked up. So uh, one of those Bob Clouser retrieves is he always adds a, a flick of the wrist at the end of the strip to give it a little bit more fly action. A bobber and a fly? No way. You're kidding me bobbers i thought they're called strike indicators well strike indicator is just a bobber right when it dunks you set the hook right just like a bobber so floats bobbers strike indicators whatever you want um i've caught a lot of fish doing this off the beach i generally like to do this when there's wave action on the beach when the water's calm i like to strip them when the water is a little wavy, I like to use a fly underneath the float um, because that fly underneath the float is going up and down in the water because that bobber is going up and down on the surface of the lake. So this can actually be a very deadly technique using it. Um, I like to use this technique when I'm a little closer to the tributary mouth where fish had a tendency to go out and come in, go out and come in. So you're actually keeping that fly closer to the strike zone because those fish are sooner or later going to come swimming right back through there, right? Well, they're going to come swimming right back through there 
and they're going to see that fly going doing, 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 doing underneath that bower, underneath that float, underneath that indicator. It's a very deadly technique. And you can use different kinds of fly patterns underneath there. Streamer flies work doing it. <clears throat> Those marabou uh, beadhead flies work well doing it. Uh, little precious fly works real well doing it. Um, virtually, I've even, I, I've even seen friends of mine, and I've done that on, on occasion on my own too. You can even catch steelhead off the beach using an egg pattern. Give it a shot. It does work at times. If I can't catch them stripping, then I'll go to the indicator rig. If I can't catch them on a little precious under an indicator or a bobber or float, um, then I might go to an egg pattern under a float. But uh, can you catch fish off the beach on an egg pattern? Yes, you can. I'd much rather catch them on streamers. Um, most of those fish before they run are feeding on bait fish. So you're matching the hatch. But uh, yeah, egg, egg, egg patterns on their indicators do work. Next, next, next slide. So once that hits the water, I want to point the rod. I want to drop that rod tip down, right? I want to get tight to my fly line and give it short little strips. You can lift the rod, short jerking actions. Shimmy and shake that float, shake that float. Bring that rod back towards you. Drop it back down, take up the slack. Shimmy that back towards you. Watch how those spin fishermen are fishing jigs underneath bobbers on Lake Erie. They're doing the same thing. What you're doing is you're making that fly bounce up and down underneath that indicator, and it's creating life. It's creating something that will attract the fish. Next slide. Uh, I use polystyrene styrene floats. Um, uh, for, for indicators, uh, you can change the depth very easily. Another way to manage casting with the bobber rig um, is to skitter it up to the surface before you cast these rigs. The other thing I will sometimes do, in fact, I, I haven't talked about this, is terminal tackle. I will sometimes use small blackbird shot between my fly and the indicator. And then when you got shot on the end of your indicator, you got to lift that weight to the surface in order to be able to cast it again. So you want to lift it, skid it up, get that weight up on the surface, skid it across the surface, and you can either roll cast it or start your double haul cast on the back stroke. Okay. Commentary. Anybody got any questions out there? These are some of the topics we, we, we talked about. We talked about uh, Lake Erie South, South Shore Fishery as an untapped fly fishing resource, which it is no longer. <clears throat> uh, we talked about when and where to surf zone, fly fish for steelhead. Uh, we talked about gear and tackle, what you need. We talked about flies, and uh, I believe we talked about presentation and what works. Does uh, anybody out there have any questions for me? I'd, I'd love to get some questions if anybody has them. Uh, if you want to read more uh, about Surf Zone Steelhead, I'm pretty sure I covered uh, this in a chapter in, in, in uh, Great Lakes Steelhead Salmon and Trout Essential Techniques. Um, one of my best articles I ever wrote for Fly Fisherman Magazine uh, was Surf Zone Steelhead. Uh, you might be able to find that article in Fly Fisherman, Fly Fisherman Magazine's archives. That's kind of what kicked it off around here. Um, I think I get, get into a lot more on wind direction in that article. But I think wind direction, when you're fishing the beach, wind direction is 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 one of the first things that, that you want to consider when you get to a beach and you say to yourself, where am I going to fish? I just got to a beach, where am I going to fish? Which way is that wind blowing? Is it blowing from the west to the east? If it's blowing from the west to the east, I expect to find my fish to the east somewhere. If the wind's blowing from the east to the west, I would expect to find my fish to the west somewhere. 
Any questions, guys? I, I've got a couple, Carl. Great job, by the way. Can you hear oh. me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, this is Mark Altieri. I was just down in Cuba with Jerry. Oh, hi, Mark. How are you doing? Good, good. Very good. Um, the, the, the one thing that intrigued me, because it, like you, I'm a simple guy. Yeah. Was the, was the white woolly buggers. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell, and, and I also love sight fishing. I do, do a lot of sight fishing for carp on the Rocky River, on the yeah. local river here. And um, on those southern, southerly wind days, on the clear water, clearer water days, um, I used to carp fish with George Von Schrader up in Lake Michigan, where it was just gin clear water. It's not that down here. Uh, tell me about seeing the sight, sight fishing for these cruising steelhead on those clearer water days and talk a little bit more about the uh, unifly there, the white woolly bugger. Well, I, I don't often use white woolly buggers. I, I used to, you know, I'm not saying I never caught a steelhead off a beach with a white woolly bugger because uh, like my buddy uh, uh, Mark used to say, all you need is a white woolly bugger, whether you're fishing a tributary or off the beach. Yeah. I mean, white, I, I, you know, how many, how many fly colors do you need? How many do you really need? All white and all black, really. Most of the time, right? Yeah. Um, maybe throw an olive on top of that or, or maybe chartreuse. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm more, it really kind of depends what I, when I see steelhead, like bait fish flying out of the water or bait fish jumping out of the water and, and, and I know the steelhead are on them. I, I certainly want to imitate what they're eating, right? Mm -hmm. I want to imitate those young of the year emerald shiners or maybe an adult emerald shiner. Mm -hmm. um, getting back to the um, um, watching them come down the beach towards you. Yeah. You, you got to be patient, okay? You, you got to, I mean, I've gone to beaches in the morning, no fish there. Go back there in the evening and there they are. Um, to me, part of that hunt, you know, it's part hunting, right? Part of it's hunting, going from place to place to place, trying to find out where they are. Um, you know how steelhead are in the tributary, uh, just because they're there one day doesn't mean they're going to be there the next day. Right. Right. Conditions change. Steelhead move. That's the enigma of chasing steelhead. Uh, they don't sit still. Um, so the best, if you want to sight cast, the school's coming down, down, down the beach. Number one, consider that wind direction, okay? Consider that wind direction. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I don't know if you ever saw that Fly Fisherman magazine article I wrote on it. Um, those pictures that open up that article were taken a half a mile down the beach in a cove that pushed the steelhead into this cove on a northeast wind, believe it or not. Um, so you want to hunt, um, and, and you hit Carl, you could see them. Well, what lets, you know, what lets you know that they're there, Mark is fish are jumping out of Lake Erie or you see fish visually rolling. Yeah. Okay. So you want to make sure you're in an, an area where you have confidence that you're going to see steelhead you know, locate yourself somewhere near a tributary mouth, somewhere near a tributary mouth. Yeah. Let that tributary mouth be your starting point, Mark. Gotcha. And broaden, broaden your search or broaden your hunt away from that tributary mouth. Yeah. Um, what, so Carl, if I, if I go to, to a tributary mouth and I don't see like a lot of fish jumping or breaching or rolling, I can sometimes become discouraged, but that's not to say I'm not going to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. um, my, I actually caught a steelhead this past fall on my first cast in the Lake Erie, um, but I wasn't seeing any fish rolling or jumping or, or anything like that. I'm like, well, they should be here. 
you know, the water temperature is 65. The fish should be here. I get lucky and make my first cast in the Lake Erie and actually catch a fish this year. It's a lot harder than that. Um, <laughs> but I really like the hunting aspects of this. Yeah. I, I like the exploratory aspects of doing this. I like the search of doing this because I, I want to find a place where I can catch steelhead off a beach where nobody else knows that they're there, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, but start your search near that tributary mouth. Um, you can oftentimes see steelhead cruising up and down the beach by standing near a tributary mouth. But make sure you let the wind direct you yeah, in your search one way or the other. And even if it's a slight southeast or southwest wind, you're still drifting west or east against the wind? I, I'm, I'm still looking. Yes, I'm still looking in, in, the, in the other direction. Yeah, gotcha. And and especially, especially if there's current going out into the lake. And one last question before I'll, I'm hogging the, your time here. No, no, it's okay. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. What, when you're in a, this clearer water sight fishing mode, how are, are we talking 30 feet offshore, 40 feet offshore? Great question. Great, great, great question. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't even talk about this, okay? I got, here's a good story. There used to be this big boulder on this certain Lake Erie beach that I used to love wading out and standing on top of it, okay? I get up on this big boulder. Oh, look at me, boys. Look at me double haul that fly line way on the Lake Erie. <laughs> I can throw that as far as you can throw your spoon. Boy, am I freaking good. <laughs> There's a guy behind me hooking fish. <laughs> I hear the splashing behind me. So I back out of there, right? I go to the beach. And I got to give Ray Bouch credit. I learned a lot from this guy. So I'm on this big rock bombing. Yeah, you know, I'm bombing, I'm stripping. And yeah, I'm not saying you can't catch fish that way because you can. But I hear the splashing behind me. There's a guy playing the steelhead behind me. I, I walk, walk to the shore and I start talking to this super, super nice gentleman. I go, what's going on here? He goes, well, if you keep waiting out there like that, you're going to scare the school off the beach. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, if you stand on the shore, those fish will come swimming you could poke them with your darn rod tip if you want to. Ooh. They will come into ankle deep water, knee deep water, especially, especially at first light. The other thing to look for, Mark, is nervous water. Mm -hmm. Look for nervous water. Like if you're hiking down the beach, and you see like a little ripply areas in yep. a cove or something like that, that could be a giveaway to a big school. I'm serious. That could be a giveaway to a big school. Great, Carl. Hey, I'll turn it over to the other guys. Okay. Mark, thanks for the, thanks for the question. That, hey, I, I really take that seriously because I now try to teach that, that I learned Ray, you know, a lot of times, Especially if, if there's outflow going into the lake. I'm not talking about a harbor, um, but even a small stream with outflow going into the lake, okay? What do they want to do? They want to they come and sniff that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. They want to come in there. They want to sniff it. They're searching for a place to go is what they're doing. They'll come in to ankle deep water, sniff their nose up that tributary mouth, and then circle back out. If you stand still, they're going to circle back out. They're going to come right back in again. Mm -hmm. That's why I tell a lot of guys that are fishing these beaches, and I learned this the hard way a long, long time ago, <clears throat> that if you keep your feet dry, 
there's sometimes, and you can't, I, I mean, I try to educate guys on the beach. I'm like, you know what? Hey, if you come stand next to me on this beach and you don't wade out to your chest, they're going to come swimming right in front of you. And it'll be a lot more fun to catch them. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, you know, what could be better than sight casting the steelhead uh, cruising up the beach? So sometimes you want to wade, sometimes you don't. But that was a hard lesson for me to learn, having – an old timer, Ray Bouch, who, who's a good friend of mine now, catching them behind me. If anybody's gone down to Trout Run in Pennsylvania, you'll see guys waving out. And Trout Run is like the beach place fishing spot in Erie, right? Guys will wait out there west steep. Well, you know what? Go down there and look. There's fish swimming behind them. Sometimes you just want to stand on the shore and just be patient. Patience really, really, really pays off on beach, on beach fishing. It really pays off on surf zone fishing. Sometimes you just got to wait and wait for them to show up. Sometimes you got to go hunt them down. It's different every day, and, and that's what makes it so challenging. And I, I just thought, I'm sorry, guys, but I got to throw one more question. <laughs> uh, so usually I'm in deer hunting mode in the fall. I don't do much fall fishing, but I do a lot of spring fishing. Get, it, and normally you, uh, I'm just tributary fishing. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in early March to late April. What, what are the optimal times for the spring fishing from shore? I don't, I don't do a lot of spring fishing uh, from the beaches like I used to, because, I mean, there's a big run coming up the creek, right? Um, up the tributaries. But those first steelhead that I caught in 82 or 80, I think it was 83, those were all March fish. Those were all spring fish. Okay. Those are March fish. Okay. Um, you will find some fish off the beaches in April, um, but those are going to be dropback fish. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those dropback fish that are three, three years old, they get back to the lake and they die. Yeah. We have, I mean, I, I, I've worked with Penn State uh, doing uh, scale sample studies here in Erie, Pennsylvania, scale sample studies. And the majority of our fish are three years old. Um, you know, your four-year-old fish and five-year-old fish are an actual rarity around here. But to me, I don't do it as much as I used to, but March is the best time off the beach. Gotcha. Great and I, I, I don't know um, um, whether I, I think you do, but I've never been to these. You might even want to check out some of these warm water discharges over in the Ohio area. Yeah. During the winter. Good, Carl. Thank you. Oh, uh, you're very welcome, Mark. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. Hey, Carl. It, it's Jerry. I was going to ask you about the spring thing. And uh, one of the other guys up on the chat, Bob, was going to ask you about the spring thing, too. And you kind of just answered that with Mark. Yeah, I, I honestly don't do it like I used to, to be totally honest. Um, uh, but those were those were some of my 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 first. The, the, hey, you know what? Here's another way to get get away from people, guys. Go instead of running up and down that tributary all day, go hit the beaches in the spring. Yeah, yeah. I used. I mean, I always did it in March. I, I rarely did it in April, but. That's how I used to used to catch them. I used to catch them in March off the beach where we had a little warm water waterfall dumping in to Lake Erie. Um, I, I think March, you know, the spring steelhead beach fishery is, is maybe that is now our untapped fishery. You know, hey, I, I'm guiding guys. I got to get them on fish. You know, the, the other thing about beach fishing is it can be hit or miss, guys. It can be hit or miss. It can be hit or miss. 
Uh, more as tributary fishing. Tributary fishing's going to be, uh, it's basically just playing a lot easier, right? Number one, um, it's just going to be easier. The fish are in a confined area. Maybe, maybe that uh, a beach spring fishing is that, is that now untapped resource because I see a lot more people do, do, doing it in the fall than I used to. Good, good stuff, Carl. Something to think about for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Yep. And, you know, we, we do have a little bit of warm water discharge stuff here. It's tough to get into them. Yeah. Along there, you know, but if, if you can get into them, you can definitely catch fish. So, yeah, we know that for sure. So uh, any other any other questions or anything from anybody? All right. Guess not. Carl, you covered stuff in great detail. Thank you. Uh, we'll have this program up on YouTube probably by the end of the week. Uh, anybody needs to go back and, you know, for reference and stuff like that. Uh, other than that, remember the, the fly fishing. You're putting me on YouTube, Jerry. <laughs> you're on YouTube, you're going to be on YouTube, Carl. Yep. So tell your fans, you know. Uh, yeah, I'll tell all three of them. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, don't forget the film tour coming up. Uh, on yeah. March. We got other stuff happening down the road. And uh, other than that, great program, Carl. Thank you very much. Uh, and, thank you guys for, for, for asking me to do it. I really appreciate it a whole bunch. And uh, we'll probably see you somewhere on the water this spring. Peace out, fellas. Hey, oh, hey, before, Thanks, we, before we cut off, why don't you give uh, everybody some contact information? Because I know you do Presque Isle and all that. Yeah, yeah I love, I love uh, fly fishing on Presque Isle. Um, I'm not, I'm not like a big self-promoting guy. I'm not into self-promoting or anything like that. Um, I do have a Facebook page. I don't do other social media. Um, my uh, email address is flyfisherycarl, with a K, at AOL.com. Um, my phone number is 814-504-8264. And uh, I hope it warms up next week. Maybe we'll get a little window here, but... We got a lot of snow, boys. A lot of snow. Oh, yeah. Got it. All right. Thanks again. George, I want to tap into that <laughs> library behind you. Yeah, there <laughs> I want to I I thank George. Uh, George has given me some of the best books I've ever written or I've ever read, uh, especially uh, the, life and, uh, the Life and Death of the Great Lakes. Phenomenal read. There's a great, there's a great book that was published uh, in Erie. Um, Erie was actually the um, worldwide capital of commercial fishing at one time. Um, there's a book um, that I have that I think uh, it's just fascinating. It's called Fortune and Fury, the commercial fishing story of, of Erie, Pennsylvania. And do you know what else is so great about Erie, guys? If it wasn't for Erie, Pennsylvania, and Oliver Hazard Perry, we might not even be a country anymore. <laughs> we not have we might not have even become a country. There you go. Uh, the whole naval American fleet that won the Battle of Lake Erie, that cut off the British supply line, was built right here in Erie, Pennsylvania. Is that right. Wow. Darn right it was. But uh, another good book to read is Fortune and Fury. Nice job, Carl. Uh, say the name again, Carl. Fortune, like fortune. making a fortune. Yeah. Fortune and Fury. Got it. It's a fascinating book. I read, I read something every night before I go to bed. I, I read a book every night before I go to bed. Then I get tired, and then I put the book down. Right now I'm reading uh, uh, The Deer Slayer. Um, part of the leather stocking tales. Yep. And um, it's my second second read on it already. <clears throat> hey, hey, not to stretch this out, but Paul J wants James to Fenimore Cooper. Yeah, Paul wants to know about the Erie Otters. 
you know what? I don't, I'm sorry, but I don't, I don't follow uh, hockey like I do the Bills. Okay. And oh my God, what a heartbreak we had. Oh huh? yeah. Oh yeah. One of the best football games I've ever seen in my life. You know what? <clears throat> All I can say, it's a good thing that we've learned how to endure with failure at all the Super Bowls and all the championship games. And now another playoff game down the tubes. But you know what? Get kind of used to it by now, huh? Hey, we're, we're Jerry and I are in Cleveland. Yeah. <laughs> we, we hear least, you know how it is. <laughs> yeah. At least you've been to the big game. All yeah, right. at least we went there a few times, huh? Uh, all right. Let's wrap All right, up. guys. Hey, thanks a lot. Had a bunch of fun. Thanks a lot, Carl. Thanks. Okay, you guys have a great night. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Bob.